Good evening and welcome to the fifth annual pitch night. Woo! My name is Polly Reynolds. I'm the head of adult services and archives here. Um, just before we get started, I just want to thank um, the Burton D. Morgan Foundation um, for generously sponsoring not only tonight's event, um, but our ongoing program series, our books, our print materials, our databases. Um, they've generously supported all of this. We're very appreciative. Um, this, yes. <laughs> This year is, a, is their 50th anniversary, and I want to turn the microphone over to Angel Evans, Senior Program Officer at the Bur Burton T. Morgan Foundation, for a few words. I really feel like Polly said most of what I was going to say, but uh, I'll still give my little spiel. Um, as Polly said, I am Angela Kolick Evans, Senior Program Officer with Burton D. Morgan Foundation in Hudson. We are a private foundation whose mission is to champion the entrepreneurial spirit. And to that end, we fund a variety of programs and activities designed to help people cultivate their entrepreneurial skills and to think of innovate, innovative solutions to uh, life's problems. So as Polly said, it is our 50th anniversary, which is a major milestone for the foundation. During those 50 years, we have funded many amazing organizations, including Hudson Library and Historical Society. Um, our primary activity here is the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship Research, and it is upstairs. I encourage you, the public, to take advantage of those resources. There is business counseling, workshops, and many databases, um, one being lynda.com, which you can complete an activity and then post a certificate to your LinkedIn profile. So it's a really great free service that you can take advantage of. Um, we've supported the pitch night for five years. It is a phenomenal event. Each year I meet so many great entrepreneurs and small business owners from across Northeast Ohio, and it's really exciting to see some students from Western Reserve Academy. Thank you for your submission. I look forward to hearing your pitch as well as everyone else. Um, and again, thank you for your attendance tonight. It means a lot to see that you support entrepreneurship um, in the area, and let's get on with the show. Thank you. Before we start, um, I just want to introduce tonight's judges. There are full biographies of all of the judges in your program packets. Um, so I just will do this briefly. Mike Belzito, raise your hand, co-founder of Product Collective. Chris Faircloth, um, Akron Lending Manager at ECDI. Lisa Foley, Opportunity Manager and Senior Lending Officer for Growth Opportunity Partners. And Charles Stack, CEO of Flash Starts. Um, briefly, so that everyone's on the same page, the rules for tonight. Each finalist will have 10 minutes to pitch. Um, no more than 10 minutes. If you finish less than 10 minutes, you, that's it. Um, if you've, um, once the buzzer sounds, um, we're going to cut you off. Um, you can finish your sentence, but that'll be, that'll be it. Um, judges will be allowed five minutes to ask questions. Um, we'll also be strict on the timing for that as well. If you finish your pitch less than 10 minutes, judges still only get five minutes to ask questions. Um, I think that's it. Um, we will not be introducing each finalist in between. So once that person, once the, the pitch is finished and you know your order, which everyone should have their order, just go ahead and stand up. We'll give you the signal when we're ready and we'll, we'll start the timer. All right, let's pitch. Contestants number one. My name is Cole Tossoff. This is my partner. Anupam Kaul, and we are Bayou Krishi Udyogon, Cleveland. We are building an indoor urban farm using aeroponics technology. Aeroponics is an advanced form of hydroponics. We will be selling a wide variety of boutique and exotic rice 
potatoes, mushrooms at at order quantities. These will be targeted at small uh, small local supermarkets, restaurants, and connoisseurs. Uh, <clears throat> our goal here is to is to cut down on the storage time and transportation cost of our specialized varieties. And to do that, we plan to implement a pre-order system and then use that pre-order system to schedule our grow cycles. Um, <clears throat> we'll be giving um, estimated delivery dates because the technology allows that. We'll also be giving progress reports along the way, and we'll give notifications at final delivery or shipping. Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and we'll provide shipping as well as on-site pickup. Um, we decide to base our <clears throat> company on rice because we can not only sell the rice uh, itself, but we can also use the byproducts of the rice um, to develop other product lines. So um, we can develop, we can grow and sell specialty varieties of rice. Also, anything that is, any grains that are broken or underdeveloped can be processed into alcohol. Um, it can be processed into rice flour and then <clears throat> straw, which is most of the rice plant, can be used to grow mushrooms, which are in turn used to uh, produce CO2 to feed the plants. Then you have rice husk, which is a type of natural plastic and is used regularly in hydroponics to grow root vegetables like potatoes or peanuts. And so we'll use that to grow a variety of potatoes that are not generally sold in stores. Then, because we're going to have a large amount of dead plant mass, uh, we can compost that from the roots or dead plant, dead potato plants and used up mushroom logs. We'll compost that and then use the extract of that called compost tea to re-fertilize both our potatoes and our rice crop. And anything that is not used by us internally can in turn be sold for profit. This is a conceptual design based on our prototype. The below squares are uh, water tanks, the long pillars in the middle, The long pillars in the middle are uh, supporting the curtains, the curtains on which the rice is grown. The round circular um, cylindrical tube on the top has the mechanical and electrical components that we need. The rectangular slabs that you can see on the mid middle are the lights. They have lights on both sides, so that's why plants are going towards them. Aeroponics is growing plants suspending in air with a mist or a fog of water, a nutrient-rich water blown directly on the roots. Because of this, it is very water, nutrient, and time efficient. Also, since there is no soil, uh, no, uh, with no soil and the constant airflow, weeds are eliminated. And also, the rot, mold, and any uh, plant disease are drastically reduced. The airflow also lets the plant's roots to breathe freely, further increasing the growth rate. And for our pur purpose of the lack of soil, allows us to have minimum, uh, allows us to have multiple planting and variety in close proximity about contaminating soil. Also, because this method is self-contained, it allows us to grow near urban areas without worrying about the contaminating soil. Since we are going to grow indoor with limited square footage, we design our system on a vertical plane that is 20 feet tall. That means that the curtains that you can see are 20 feet tall. In a 50,000 square foot facility will give us 140,000 square feet of rice growing space. 
also another 20,000 square feet of uh, uh, space for potatoes with the mushroom suspended in the dead space. Vertical plane growing allows us to use the natural airflow of heat rising and cold falling, which reduces energy spent on the blowers. It also uses shared light, grown uh, grow racks, plumbing and electronics. As you can see, one, uh, two rows of the plants are grown from a, uh, one system. So they share the uh, plumbing and the electronics. Finally, since workers can see all the plants from the floor, they can easily check for and report issues. This along with the shared equipment simplifies maintenance. Okay, <clears throat> for our expenses, um, we did some research, we also got some advice, and through that we figured that it'll take us about $2.1 million to start with an annual budget of about 488000 um, We estimate that <clears throat> with, based on prices we've seen, average prices from the government and stores, that for rice we'll make about $192,000 a year. Um, <clears throat> the potatoes will give us about $56,500 a year, and <clears throat> the mushrooms will be $504,000 a year, adding up to um, $752,000 a year, approximately. And given those numbers, we figured that our rate of return is that we'll break even in a little over four and a half years, start making money by year five, and have approximately $3.8 million value by year 10. We have been awarded uh, uh, $2,500 of scholarship from our uh, Cleveland State University to do the research on the same. Thank you for listening to us. That's all from our side. If you have any questions, please ask. So, so I have a question. The technology sounds really interesting. The use case sounds really interesting. But rice? I mean, it's like one of the cheapest products in the world. 25 cents a pound. And, and it, it's one of the few products that ships well. So it's both inexpensive and easy to ship. It just seems like completely the wrong product. Yes, and in most ways, we'd kind of agree, but there is still a massive untapped market for it. Um, the guesses I've seen is, uh, I think it's about 10 billion uh, tons are shipped each year, and that's still only about 60 or 70 percent of the market is actually fed. I was actually sort of along those lines. What is the value proposition to the to your customer? It's like same as Charlie said, like the technology looks really cool, but I was just curious why like the customers you plan on serving, why might they choose your rice over the rice that they can get elsewhere or and, and other foods? Okay. Um, what we're looking at is a variety that is generally very hard to get. So one example of this would be Hasawi red rice which is grown in a very specific part of Saudi Arabia next to the ocean in a delta. Currently, they're having a problem with it going extinct due to the rest of Saudi Arabia sucking up the water it needs to grow. And so the price is, as of I think three years ago, $30 a pound, and it's only growing because they can't grow enough of it anymore. And in our type of a setup, we can grow varieties like that and sell them. Um, we can also grow a greater variety so where in a regular store you go in there you'll see five varieties of rice. Well there's generally more varieties out there than is shown in the store. It's just the ones in the store are the ones that are the most durable for field growing under chemicals. So the question I would have then would be 
Okay, maybe I should use this. So the question I would have then is if you're growing these specialty uh, types of foods, is there something that, um, you know, is there demand for that locally? Are you intending on your end, uh, you know, the, the companies that are, or businesses that you're selling to, are they going to generate the demand for you, or is this something you're going to ship nationally or internationally? We plan to start locally, um, and then with Amazon being right here now, we can ship anything uh, nationally or lo globally if we get those kinds of orders. And what does the name of the company mean? It's a transliteration that literally means aeroponic industries. Okay. We, have, we have 30 seconds left or something. Um, <laughs> the, you didn't quite use this phrase, but you said the concept. So I would focus heavily on the phrase grow to order. Okay. Because that's really unique, especially if you're dealing with exotic varieties of rice and the turnaround time and you can say you want X tons of blank exotic rice, we can grow that to order in blank weeks. That starts to have an appeal from a business standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, at any rate, I want to say uh, that we are growing rice because uh, our other bioproducts are based on rice too. So we are using a lot of uh, bioproducts of rice to grow those things. And um, uh, why we are, this is a kind of technology that you can go start living in Mars. You can use this to grow plants. You can do whatever you want and you can grow whole year. You don't have to wait for four months. Uh, you don't have to grow rice once in a year. You can grow four times in a year. That's all. All right. Okay. Thank you. Contestant number two, please. Okay, we're starting the timer. All right, so hello everyone. I am Stephanie Ham. I am CEO and co-founder of Onco Solutions, which is a newly founded company in Akron that provides an innovative cancer drug screening technology to pharmaceutical industry customers. So the problem, I can sit here and read you these numbers about cancer, but the general idea is that cancer sucks. And I think a lot of people in this room have their own personal accounts. Um, I've witnessed both my parents suffer through cancer, and actually just walking in here today, I got a message that my aunt was just diagnosed with cancer. So it's a huge problem, and I'm sorry that everyone has their own stories, but I'm hoping that our technology can be helpful. So one of the major reasons that cancer remains such a large problem is because of the way that cancer drugs are treated in the pharmaceutical industry. So first, cancer drugs of interest are tests on these 2D models, which are just flat layers of cancer cells grown in a plastic dish. Then those cancer drugs that move forward into, an then move forward into animals for drug testing and then into clinical trials to be tested in patients. However, using this existing workflow, the cancer drugs that are first tested onto these 2D cancer cell models that then move forward into animal studies have a 50 to 80% failure rate and waste half a million dollars in six months of time per failed compound. Then those cancer drugs that move forward to clinical trials have a 95% failure rate and waste billions of dollars in years of time. This problem really starts at the testing on these 2D models. Since these are just flat layers of cancer cells, they do not really model the properties of a tumor in the body. That really impacts how a drug is going to respond, since we are three-dimensional and so are tumors. So one potential way to solve this problem is to use three-dimensional cancer cell models that can bridge this large gap between 2D models and animal studies to filter out ineffective compounds earlier in the process, saving time and money. And if 3D cancer cell models were used, they could reduce these animal failure rates to half. 
So this means that we could double the number of successful animal studies just in the tenth of amount of time if we use 3D cancer cell models in this process. Despite these pot potential benefits though, 3D cancer cell models are not being used in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is because they have many disadvantages and the pharma industry does not think that they meet their standards and they cannot grow 3D cancer cell mo models with all cancer cell types. They're not robust or reliable enough and they just do not perform well and give them the drug data that they need to see to help them decide whether or not to move a drug forward into animal studies. Onco Solutions has developed a technology though, which is the first technology that can grow 3D cancer cell models compared to existing methods, and is robust and automated and can grow these models with different cancer cell types that existing methods cannot, is very robust and meets the pharma industry's standards. It can also accommodate 16 times the number of cancer drugs than existing methods, and it also is very fast and has a low associated labor cost because it's automated. We've also been able to preliminarily validate this technology and show its usefulness in the preclinical workflow. We took a 2D model and drug tested it. As shown here with the red bar, the drug with this 2D model was pretty effective in killing most of the cancer cells. But when we took the same cancer cell type with the same cancer drug and tested an Onco Solutions 3D model, the drug was completely ineffective. And this reflected what happened in animal studies. So if the pharma industry would have used our technology, we could have shown them that this drug was going to fail in the animal studies and save them that half a million dollars in six months of wasted time. And those resources could have been uh, focused on a cancer drug that was more likely to succeed down the line. So Onco Solutions is serving as a contract research organization in which we provide a drug screening service to the pharmaceutical industry customers. So this works in which a customer will bring us cancer drugs, we will test them on our 3D cancer cell models, and then we'll provide them with drug efficacy data to help them decide whether or not to move that forward into animal studies. I've led my team in interviewing 122 potential customers to validate this business model and learn that a lot of the drug testing needs by the pharma industry are already being contracted out to CROs or contract research organizations. We were also able to validate a, a really strong industry support, including Pfizer, who has taken an interest in our company, and one of their scientists has personally offered to help us through our validation studies. We've also began preliminary discussions with a local contract research organization called Cleveland Diagnostics, who is currently serving pharma customers and is interested in partnering for us to serve our technology through them. And serving as a contract research organization, we fit into a $1.5 billion target market. So Onco Solutions, importantly, does not require FDA approval. Since it's such an early stage decision making tool, we are clear of those regulations. And we've made a lot of significant progress since our formation in 2016. And since we don't need FDA approval, that really expedites our path to market. We are currently scaling up our technology to make sure we can accommodate the large drug libraries that a pharma industry will typically work with and ensuring its robustness at the industry standard. Then this will lead to more extensive testing, which will be the 3D tests versus the animal drug tests. And then this will lead to uh, market entry, hopefully in 2019, in which we can have direct sales with uh, pharma customers directly or through um, partnering with contract research organizations. We have an issued and a filed patent covering our technology. Uh, these are owned by the University of Akron, but we have a licensing agreement in place. I'm co venter on both of these along with our chief technical officer. And this is our management team. So I am the CEO. I actually just graduated in August with my PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Akron. So this was actually my dissertation work for the past five years. I worked on developing and optimizing this technology and getting it to the stage it is today. Uh, Hossein Tavana has overseen the development of this technology and has helped with it, and he now serves as our chief te technical officer. And Elise Ball was our business mentor through our customer discovery phase. Uh, when we went through the National Science Foundation i Sites and Teams program and interviewed potential customers, and she's also helped a lot with our business development to get us to where we are today. And I'm also really grateful uh, for the wide range of expertise we have in our advisory board ranging from um, startup experience to fundraising to pharma experience. Uh, they've been really instrumental and helpful to get us to where we are today. 
And so with that, Onco Solutions has really validated the strong unmet need in the pharma industry, which is the high failure rate of cancer drugs in the animal studies. And this just really affects the clinical trials as well, because everything that happens on the preclinical translates to clinical. And 3D cancer cell models could really bridge this gap and provide a more efficient way to test cancer drugs while saving time and money and allowing resources to be more focused on cancer drugs likely to succeed. And this will ultimately help the clinical side. Uh, so we validate a very large market opportunity. I've also gained a strong industry support, so we're confident in our capabilities to get to market by 2019. And so I thank you, and I welcome any questions you have. I have a question. Yeah. What ways are you getting the industry to buy into the new, the 3D technology? So. What, yeah, that's a good question. So the farm industry is difficult, but what is really great is the time is now to do this because every potential customer we talk to, there's interest to use 3D cancer cell models. It's not a secret that it's better, so everyone is on board that they want to use it, but just the existing methods have not met their standards that they have not adopted it. So that's why we're fairly confident if we show how robust and reliable our technology can be and you, the high value in it, that they will be willing to adopt it. Um, but yeah, they, everyone is very interested in using 3D cancer cell models, and even some kind of dabble in it, but they just have not actually incorporated it into their workflow because it's just not robust and consistent enough. Um, how much do you feel like you need to get to a point where you know, you're at the beginning of 2019 and you can actually start selling? So like, how much do you need to raise to get to that point? Yeah, so our technology, we're an early stage company, but our technology is very well developed. And if a customer came up to us today, we could serve them. Um, so we are trying to target smaller pharma industry and biotech companies that would be kind of earlier adopters for this type of technology at this stage. Um, so, but the validation work is really to target that larger pharma um, market. And we project about one million to do those validation sites to get those customers. Um, but yeah, our technology, if, you know, we, the scale up is again kind of targeted towards those larger pharma customers that would need that. But these smaller customers as early adopters, you know, if they came up to us today and wanted to use it, we could provide this with them. Okay, thank you. So most startups fail. Mm -hmm. What would you say right now is the most likely reason that your company will not be successful? So, <laughs> I don't want it to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. So, it, it, you know, working with the farm industry, I, I think if we lose traction and if we don't stay on track with, you know, a customer interface is such an integral part of this. You, having feedback back and forth of knowing what they want to see specifically. Uh, there's measurements and there's data we can show them over and over again. But to have this interface with the customers and have them be like, we need to see this, you need to do this, and kind of develop a strategic partnership with a pharma customer. So we're kind of working more side by side. Um, instead of us, you know, kind of guessing what they want, I think that would make us fail. So I think really critical to making us succeed is just nurturing these relationships with co potential customers we have, constantly taking their input and making sure we're doing the right experiments to show them the right things they need to see. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a question because I, I skipped this day of science class, so you have to forgive my ignorance. Um, so when you when you're doing these 3D models, how do you how does this translate to to reality essentially, mm -hmm. and and how do you know that it's going to be accurate when you do that? Right, that's a great question. Um, so besides the fact that it's just 3D, which is a big, I mean, so if you just look at three dimensionality that makes a huge difference in cell biology. When you take cells and you seed them in a plate and it's just a flat layer versus you clump them together into a ball, the biology and the genetics are so completely altered. It's, it's insane. And the drug responses are just completely different in that case. But once you have this culture of 3D, there's just so many different cues going on with the cells that is causing you know, their responses, the way they're growing, how they're reacting um, is completely different. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's always a question of how close are we getting to the animals and the patients. And so with 3D models, you can incorporate other cell types to make it even more realistic that are often incorporated in cancer, like normal cell types that are in the environment or proteins. So there's, and our technology is well adopted to do that. We can incorporate other elements of the body that would be playing an influence in this. I, 
so, and, and you might have gotten into this and maybe probably went over my head, but the 3D modeling, it, it exists, like this already exists in other mm -hmm. places. What sets yours apart? Like what, wh how is yours different? I would say the biggest thing, um, so yes, it exists. There's a lot of competitors out there, but they're all plates or products. Ours is a technology. So we have adopted this to be a robotic platform, and it's actually the same platform that they're using right now for 2D models, but we've just created a way to make it 3D now with the same tools they're already using to create the 2D. So we don't need any specialized plates or you know, products to make this work. We have just created this technology, and the fact that it's te technology means it's more precise, it's more robust, it's more reliable. Okay. Say so you, uh, you know, walked away with first place today. How does that actually impact your business? Right, so even just a few... Sorry, we've got to cut you off. Oh. That's time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to do the movie first or after? Yeah. Maybe I'll just ask that to everyone. Incorporated. I'm the CEO and the founder of the company. For eight years, we did research and development for uh, the military, for instance, DARPA. Recently, we got involved in this, what's called non-invasive uh, glucose monitoring. Does anybody know anybody who has diabetes, type 1 or type 2? Okay. I'm surprised all the time when I ask people how many people know somebody that has it or has it in themselves. <clears throat> I was diagnosed with type 2 back around late spring. Uh, not too happy about it, but uh, one of the things that I looked for right away was a way to have a wearable device so I wouldn't have to prick myself. Um, pricking yourself on the finger gets really old. And when they say, what prob painful problem are you solving? That's it. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Kind of move. Uh, so, I don't know if folks know it, but one out of uh, every 10 seconds, somebody dies from diabetes. Um, last year, uh, the cost of uh, diabetes for the American health care was $186 billion. So, it's a pretty massive problem. About 10 to 11 percent of the American population has diabetes, about 34 million. Worldwide, it's about f uh, 415 million. <clears throat> One thing I learned when I got diagnosed is uh, you're kind of on your own. You know, there's nobody to call, nobody to ask a question. And uh, it's kind of a strange thing, to tell you the truth. Sorry about that. So what is a glucose monitor? I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but basically it looks like a little contraption like this, and it's got a little strip that comes out, and you prick yourself and put the blood on there, and it gives you a readout. It's not very exciting. The problem is you could take a reading right now, and four or five hours from now it could be totally different, depending if 
you, what you ate and what your exercise is like. <clears throat> this gives you an idea real quick, gives you a little bit of picture there. Uh, the cost of uh, buying the strips is about $3,200 a year, believe it or not. It's very high. So this is what they call continuous glucose monitoring when you have like a patch with little micro needles in it. It's supposedly the state of the art right now. <clears throat> and the micro needles will take a reading and send it to your phone or to your uh, analyzer. One of the limitations is a lot of times when you take a reading, you don't take enough blood or you have to do it over. I can tell you uh, it's not very exciting to do this. So what we came up with and basically b based on need is a way to do it non-invasively. And non-invasive means no needles, no finger pricking. So our product is based off, you know, just to give you an example here, I don't know if people are familiar with infrared lights, but if you shoot an infrared light into the skin, you, you could go into the capillary and measure the glucose. So you're probably saying, why isn't everybody doing that? Well, they've tried for about 15 years. Nobody's really done it. So we think we can do it. And how we're going to do it is through the inf we're going to send four or five wavelengths through the skin and get a bunch of data. And the blood's kind of like a mud puddle. It's just a bunch of junk. And once we take all that data, we're going to use the artificial intelligence that I patented and the other algorithms we're going to develop to quantify the glucose. So I guess if you see on the far right, that's a sensor that's what they call an in-gas sensor that we're using. That's pretty state-of-the-art. So being able to do this is very feasible. What the tough part is, is the calibration and the quantification. So we call our project ANGEL, <clears throat> and the reason I gave it that name was uh, kind of having a friend to watch over you. So real quick, uh, we're going to make ours compatible. It doesn't make a difference if you have dark skin, uh, light skin. We're going to make it so it self-calibrates. There's no needles, no micro needles. Um, the first product we have will look something like this. It will be actually a, a little box. And you'll put your arm on it, and about four or five seconds later, it'll give you a readout. Send it to your phone. Our next product will be, will be a wearable device, and that's what you saw the movie. So we're using artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, I, we have three patents right now. Uh, we'll send an alarm for high sugar levels. All this, we'll have a subscription service where we'll log and send you a, a bi-weekly report and monthly report. So our team, uh, we actually have one person here uh, sitting over there, Jim, local resident. Uh, we have four PhDs. So we have a nice little collection of people right now. Uh, most of these people have worked on this already. So this is really helpful, other than Jim. So our near-term product plans, uh, like I told you, was this, and then we're going to have a wearable that's continuous. So our goal is to have a product that's uh, under $1,000. This would be about $879, and the wearable would be $829. This is just showing the wavelengths we're using. Uh, I just explained the technical approach. Um, we intend to use the data analytics and the-, the Two minutes left. Me. <clears throat> Two minutes of artificial techno uh, intelligent technologies we have right now. So this gives us an idea of the product cost right there. Um, right now we're doing a, um, a proof of concept for about, uh, I don't know, a month and a half to be done with that. What 
I'm looking to use the money from for tonight, if I'm so lucky, is uh, to further put money into the prototype and development and the uh, proof of concept. Also, we're going to file a couple of uh, provisional patents. And we're doing a freedom to operate, too, because there's a lot of people in this space. Now, this is what's kind of exciting. Once we are able to do the glucose, we can start doing other things, like blood flow, thickness, thinness, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood One cells. Minute. Pardon me? OK, I'm almost done. Thickness, thinness, uh, cholesterol, um, you name it, we'll be able to do it. So this is what's kind of exciting, is we can spit off a lot of other products. That's it. It's hard to talk to give all the information on this in 10 minutes. It's tough. Trust me. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was great. You had mentioned that people have tried to use the IR technology, but it hasn't hasn't worked. What? Why is that? And like, what makes it different for you and your team now? Well, it's, it's an excellent question, and I'll, t I'll tell you why that's excellent. They've tried it, and it has worked. The problem is it either worked in the lab, but wouldn't work out in the real world, or it was strictly research, or they didn't do enough wavelengths, or they didn't have the data analytics and the artificial intelligence to take the results to make it repeatable and very accurate, okay? So when you use those test strips, it's using an enzyme to get that number. And it's pretty accurate. But you'll find, I don't know how much you know about healthcare, but the biggest problem in healthcare is compliance. It's the patient. People like me that don't do it, I'll be honest with you. I hate it. You know I mean? So to make a long story short, this is really the holy grail for diabetes. And the the problem is a lot of people have been working on it, but it's been strictly university research or the companies that have worked on it. Was it Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. Remember, it's better than I thought. Mike, the problem is the people who make the strips, the big companies like Abbott and Johnson Johnson, they don't want to take away from that $3,200 a year. This would do that. It would be disruptive. appreciate that question. How long have you been working on this, and how have you funded it to this point? It's excellent. Okay. Uh, you're not going to like what I tell you. Um, not very long. Started uh, early summer, so very recently. Uh, I've been funding it uh, personally myself, all right? But uh, we have an investment banking firm that's going to raise $15 million for us. Now, I haven't seen the money yet, but they just started literally a couple weeks ago. So it's pretty new. But like I said, the team, I have four PhDs on the team. Uh, everybody's worked on it for in the past other than me. My background's really with the artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's what I did for DARPA. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> oh, we're going down the line. Okay. It's juicy. <laughs> it's juicy. <laughs> So my question is looking at the application that you submitted. Um, you listed a couple of figures. One, the figure of how much money has been put into the business so far, and then how much money has been put into this project. And so my question, given that the one number is bigger, the one number is smaller, where did the other money go, especially we given the limited time that you're talking about? We were funded from the military about, about three and a half million dollars. Okay. Right. We had about 500,000. Two minutes. Money. So we've had four million dollars today. So we're taking all that. What got me, I'll be honest with you, got me excited about this was I needed it. And when I started talking to other people, they needed it. My, uh, one of my best friends, I, he has, and I said, are you checking yourself every day? He goes, are you? I go, I asked you first. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the problem is, even when you check yourself, it changes. It's dynamic. So if you check yourself, like in the morning and then at night, by the way, your fingers get Start to hurt me and try. So there's a need for the product. And uh, the investment banker guys are looking around in China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. There's probably have five interested parties right now, including an angel group that's um, all around the United States. 
one minute. So, so I'm interested in how the AI piece adds value. I mean, I kind of loosely understand the technology that you outline, but I'm not at all clear how AI is going to help you extrapolate or interpret the results. Mm -hmm. I know Joe would like that question, but to make the long story short, it's critical because nobody else is doing it that way. And you have to crunch a lot of data. And once you crunch that data, you need the algorithms to learn. So how to, you know, in your body, there's only a tablespoon of sugar in your entire body. And those sugar molecules are very hard to find and very unidentifiable. So you need that analytics and that artificial so not to do it. That's why a lot of people haven't been able to do it yet. They haven't looked at That's that time. Way. Okay. That's a great question. Okay. Next contestant. Can you ask one more? No, it'll have to wait. All right. Thanks, guys. Go. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being here. Some of you have more of a choice than the others, but that's all right. Um, so um, tonight, I'm here to talk to you about the Bike Share Project that has been implemented in Western Reserve Academy. I'm Andrew. Um, this is Rain, and that's she standing over there. Um, so as many of you guys know, like living a life in Hudson without a car can be really inconvenient, okay? Um, like whether it's um, like, uh, but, but sometimes cars are just not the best solution to meet our transportation needs, whether it's because you're not old enough to get a driver's license or, um, or if say like one of your family members are using the car when you're supposed to use it or if it's because um, you know it's Sunday night and you just want to enjoy the nice fall season, a bit too late now. But um, so we're here to present our solution to meet those needs. So um, I'm just gonna quickly gonna go through the um, the uh, process of which people. Oh, oh, okay. All right, backtrack, backtrack. Um, so so pretty much. So uh, the three of us have been working on this project since last November, and with the help of our school administrators, we were able to purchase um, 15 bikes and, uh, um, and just uh, have our own private exclusive bike fleet um, for the students to use. And starting from last week, all the students who have signed up for our beta testing is able to um, borrow and return any of our bikes for free um, using their smartphone. So, okay, so right now, um, I'm just gonna, gonna walk you through how this, how this process works so you can get like a brief understanding of what the user experience is like. Um, so pretty much overall, the process of borrowing and returning a bike is pretty easy and intuitive. Um, so we use this app called Lattice and it's available on both Android um, platform and iOS platform. So, so if you open the app, um, it will show you all the available bikes near you. And to book the bike, all you have to do is um, click reserve right there. No puns intended. Um, and and uh, now you will have like half hold of the bike. And once you, when, once you reserve the bike, the, um, your phone will show you a step-to-step step step direction of which you can reach to the bike. And once you're in close proximity to the bike, um, the Bluetooth on your phone will actually connect to the bike and you can um, lock it and unlock it during your ride as you wish. And to return the bike is just as easy. 
Um, uh, so we have this feature called geofence setup, of which like the students will only be allowed to return our bikes um, within the designated area, just to keep stuff, you know, um, very keep the bike organized. Uh, so uh, when uh, when you're trying to return the bike, um, the app will actually ask you to take a picture of the bike, so we know that it's in good shape. And once you return the bike, it will be immediately available to the next user. All right, I'm going to turn it to Rain to talk about management. Okay. Uh, our project is easier, f easy for users, and it's also easy for managers like me. Okay, there are three important parts of our management. First is real-time monitoring, and second, just as Andrew just mentioned, is geofences, and the third is analytic. Let's see the real-time monitoring first. We can see the real-time bike status, location information, and damage reports. From this picture, we can see that we can see the fleet statues, like it's parked, and the last parked location, and the last member who use it. In the activity log, we can see the whole user history. And if any damage happened, we can just trace back to the responsible person. Geofence, just as Andrew mentioned that, it will only permit users to return their bike in the designated areas, so that it will be easier for us to manage them. Now we are having the bike share project in our campus, but like this function also allows us to have it in a larger area like Hudson Town. And the analytic will collect information and make it a report. Uh, we can see like total amount, um, total trip versus time, total distance versus time, or total duration versus time. We will analyze this report every week and adjust some setting of our bike share project in order to like uh, to make sure like no potential problems happen. So after all those introductions, uh, it's finally for us to check out the photos of those bikes. Okay, so uh, in those two photos, uh, you can see the two types of bikes that we're providing all the students and the faculty. And one on the left is the high frame, and the uh, on the right is low frame, so that you can uh, have an individual preference over uh, one of those two. And so right now, we have entered the beta testing phase of this bike share program. And uh, right now, we have uh, around 20 student volunteers uh, who are riding on those bikes, uh, providing us feedbacks um, and information to help us uh, better this in the future when we officially launch it to the entire school. And so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I can continue with the other slide. Um, so, um, um, ultimately, um, the goal of our project is to provide a community uh, where not only students will be feel convenient uh, for transportation by using those bikes, but also um, to build a place uh, where we have those recreational activities uh, enabled by um, those uh, provision of the bikes. And so, um, to help the students take the best use of those bikes, uh, we have built a website that provides uh, not only instructions as to the uh, bike borrowing process, but also um, how you are going to take advantage of those bikes to explore those areas surrounding you, the places where um, they have the great bike trails. And so, we have those features like bike trails near Western Reserve Academy, uh, where uh, we listed all kinds of uh, cool bike trails, and along we can you can also find out the ma many informations, including the location, the duration, and all such informations to help you better create student activities and to enrich um, the student life at Reserve. And so, ultimately, we are not trying to start a business, but rather we are trying to build a community that is eco-friendly. Um, so, and finally, we'll turn to bring. Two minutes. Okay, it's dream big time. Let's see the future. 
if we can get five hundred dollars, we can expand the size of our bike share project to one hundred fifteen percent. And if we can get one thousand five hundred dollars, it can be expanded to one hundred thirty percent. It's a little bit too big dream. Okay, if we have three thousand dollars, we can expand it to one hundred sixty percent. Okay, uh, like that's really a big change. Like also with this financial support, we probably can get more competitive prices from our providers. And also, we're in contact with the Hudson City Council. We are planning on provide our, uh, introduce our project or a similar bike share project to the city of Hudson as soon as next summer because we really want to contribute this community in a positive way. One minute. Thank you. <laughs> So that's the best use of funds slide I've ever seen. <laughs> it was very clear and very compelling. So congratulations on that. So what, what about outside of Hudson? I mean, do you see this ever going beyond? Um, so, this can definitely operate outside of Hudson. We probably won't be operating it, but we can definitely um, provide our experiences and um, our, uh, our, like how we've done this to other users or um, managers outside of Hudson. I don't think it will be that big of a problem. Can I add yeah, sure. And so additionally, one of the uh, most prominent feature of the SpecShare program is the fact that we have the GPS system with the lock so that we as administrators can keep track of where um, those bikes have went and who ch checked them out um, since we keep a a track of all those accounts. And so the management shouldn't be a big problem. And additionally, it would be very convenient for all those who are, on the, who are walking uh, just wandering around in the city of Hudson um, to borrow a bike um, because uh, you only need an app. And so you would also, when you uh, are done with the ride, you don't need to return it to any specific location. You can just leave it at wherever you want to leave it and then maybe the next person will come and pick it up. So. I, I understand for your beta phase, it sounds like it was free for people to use. Is there, will you be charging for this at all? And what does that look like? Okay. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you. Um, so we're not charging any of our students um, in our school just because, you know, it's a closed community. But there is a function of which you can charge a certain price for the bike ride, you know, um, regarding to how long it is or what kind of bike you're using. So we could make profit off it, but at least not in reserve. Okay. And this is, is this specifically just for uh, your school right now, or do you anticipate people within the greater Hudson community also taking part in this? Uh, it's like right now, because our project is funded by our dad's club in our school, so it's restricted for our school, but like uh, our faculty advisor, Dr. Borman, is having a like conversation with Mr. Hainan from the Hudson City Council. So probably we're going to like make it in the whole city. Okay. Uh, so a, a question, as you, as you pointed out, uh, Hudson's a suburban community. People depend on cars generally to get around. Have you done any sort of market study, um, either within your school or for people with, within the city of Hudson? And also, I mean, even just being free, um, do you have an idea of what the usage or demand would be? About two um, minutes. Okay. Um, I think uh, we haven't right now um, really done any survey as to the city, but I think one of the uh, main difference of uh, our organization is, is that uh, we are not trying to um, satisfy the need. It's not the goal. We're, we're trying to create that need because the, the goal of Atima is we're trying to promote cycling. So by putting all those bikes there, uh, we're trying to motivate people to really uh, get involved with cycling in a more healthy way of uh, commuting around the city. So even though there might not be as much need right now, as I can see, but eventually when we put it out there and people can see those bikes, they'll definitely have the drive to say, I want to try out this public bike share program. How is this different than other bike share programs? About one minute left. Um, so 
So, first of all, there's not um, enough bike share program out there. I know there are some bike share program in some big cities, but that's definitely not enough for people living in like small towns like us in Hudson. So, so what we've done a little bit differently than like those bike share programs in New York is that we made the whole system a lot more open, where it, as it will be open to um, virtually everyone who signs up for it. And instead of having like fixed bike stations at like certain points, they will be able to park the bikes anywhere as long as you know they're within the designated area. Not only will that reduce the cost of operating it, it will also um, make it just a lot more friendly for users uh, in general. Yeah. It, by the way, is that is Lattice your app, or is this is like a third party app that you're using to? like power the technology, or what was that? Uh, it's a like, third party lab okay. we rented from a company in California. OK. Five seconds. Five seconds. Oh. Just <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to cut That's it. All right, thank you. How's everybody doing? My name is Jason Williams, and I'm the founder and CEO of Give With The Program. <clears throat> Give With The Program is a nonprofit organization that promotes literacy in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, among preschool to school age kids. There are three things that make us unique. One, we offer programs year round. Two, all of our programs are hands on and project based. <clears throat> and three, we take the holistic approach to STEM education by incorporating art, language arts, music, physical education, and other subject matter in a STEM, we're better equipped to address various learning capacities. <clears throat> As a father of three African-American and Japanese children, two of whom are school age, I grew frustrated with the lack of diversity in children's STEM and STEM-related material, especially children's STEM literature. However, Instead of complaining, I did something about it. I formed a company and created a children's book series to address this need. I wanted my kids to see themselves doing this type of work. So I created the Awesome Adventures of Amina and Amir. And it's about my two oldest kids, Amina and Amir, and their awesome adventures in computer science. They're the main characters in our book series, and they're prominently displayed on our logo. And I'm proud to say, to date, we have sold a total of Zero books. <laughs> now, there's a very good and cute reason for this. This is that reason. While developing the content, my wife, who's our illustrator and graphic designer, was pregnant with Anissa. Anissa decides to show up four weeks early. The nerve of her, right? Needless to say, that threw off our timetable. In business and life in general, you must adapt. This is something that I learned at a very young age, but was reminded of with her birth. It wasn't until I started Guild the Program that I realized how much my childhood prepared me for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Guild the Program was selected to participate in LaunchU in 2015. <clears throat> LaunchU is Oberlin College's business accelerator and pitch competition. I was the only one in my cohort who was in the idea phase. All of my peers, had prototypes or had been in business for some time looking to take it to the next level. So from the beginning, I was behind the eight ball. LeBron James famously wrote, in Northeast Ohio, nothing is given, everything is earned. And being raised in a blue collar town instilled a blue collar work ethic. I managed to secure startup money and the opportunity to attend a business leadership conference in Toronto, Canada. So. How did my childhood prepare me for business? From the age of six until one month before my 18th birthday, my mother was in prison. 
During that same time frame, my father was absent. As a result, I had to move from my grandparents in one of the most poverty-stricken and crime-written communities, demographically speaking, in the entire United States. How was I able to transcend that cycle of poverty, violence, and dysfunction? I had to adapt. Whatever circumstances I put in, whatever obstacles I face, I adapt and overcome. Those same skills that allowed me to maneuver through those various pitfalls as a child allowed me to stand before you all today. How does that translate to business? I'm able to see opportunity where others don't, just as I was able to see the potential myself despite my circumstances. <clears throat> America is undergoing two major shifts. The first is demographic. America is changing. According to the 2012 U.S. Census, by the year 2044, people of color will be the new majority here in the U.S. The second shift is economic. According to the Smithsonian Science Education Center, Georgetown University, the White House, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and various economists, within the next one to three years, 2.4 million STEM jobs will go unfilled because of a lack of skilled workers right here in the U.S. Where's the opportunity? It's a no-brainer. We must train and prepare U.S. citizens for STEM careers, and it starts with training and preparing our youth for STEM education. Currently, there are 74 million preschool to school age kids in the U.S. In other words, that is a huge opportunity. Now, how can STEM address these gaps? Three reasons. One, jobs are available now. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs that are available now, but again, we can't fill because we don't have still the skilled workforce. Two, not only are jobs available now, those jobs are increasing. And last, lastly, we have jobs that are available now, jobs that are increasing, and those are higher paying jobs. Why me? Three reasons. I like the number three. One, our program work. In as little as two hours a week over the course of five weeks, we saw these gains in creative problem solving, mental focus, and cognitive integrity. Number two, we're making a difference. If you look at the gender and ethnic breakdown of our participants versus those currently in STEM careers, we're leveling the playing field. And number three, in a sense, I'm the modern James Ellsworth. Aside from the uncanny resemblance between the two of us, <laughs> we're both born and raised in Northeast Ohio. We both left our hometown, experienced a level of success, only to return to help out. In 1910, he, along with uh, Caroline Babcock, he helped establish the Hudson Library Historical Society. I established Gilbert the Program, and we did it because we saw the need. People like James Ellsworth and David Hudson, the founder of Hudson, Ohio, didn't shy away from problems. They addressed them. Get with the program is addressing two huge problems. The lack of gender and ethnic diversity in STEM and this huge jobs gap. In his own words, David Hudson cited four principles that he adhered to. And based on his actions, education and morality were at the top of the list. By promoting anti-slavery ideals and establishing Western Reserve College, he hoped to leave a legacy of excellence and enlightenment, to be a beacon in the middle of the wilderness. Supporting Get With the Program is perfectly aligned with the spirit of James Ellsworth and David Hudson. And with your support, we will continue to inspire and prepare all kids for a future in STEM. Little kids, big opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, awesome presentation. Definitely, I love, the, uh, I love the memes and everything throughout. I would pick some of those memes myself. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the actual, like, your programs, because I'm definitely curious about those. And at the end, I saw some, like, STEM Academy, STEM Camp, like, I definitely want to dig in more. Like, what is that all about? Like, maybe you could just share more info there. Yeah, and so the, uh, the STEM camps, that's our general program. We have these 
Um, so one of our programs are these one day, can everybody hear me? All right, so one of our programs are these one day uh, STEM camps that we have on Oberlin College's campus. And so we, we're partners with them. And so every time kids are out of school for holidays, in service days, or breaks, we have a themed all day STEM camp. So it's also helping the parents out. Um, and it not only exposes them to STEM, but it gives them the opportunity to interact with college, college professors, students, various facilities. We even eat lunch in the dining halls. Um, so that's our STEM camp. Our STEM academy is our after school program. And so right now we are <clears throat> working with a school in Cleveland. Um, and the, the data we collect is from Oberlin City Schools. And we've done some work with Avon local schools. Um, and then there we have another program, our STEM lab program, where we worked with a local organization. And while they were providing job training to parents, we had people work with their kids and doing hands-on project-based STEM activities. And so everything centers around hands-on project-based learning is just a setting. It takes place in different settings. And do you see this, like what does growth look like for you? Is this, um, will this stay within Northeast Ohio or do you actually see this spanning beyond Northeast Ohio? I see this um, expanding internationally. Um, we even had one of our interns from Nepal mention, um, you know, he would like to take this back to Nepal and do something similar just with the hands-on project-based learning. And, and that is po that, that, that's part of it. And so I mentioned the, the content piece that I kind of touched on it with the, uh, the, the children's book. Um, and so pretty much the, the book is the centerpiece to, you know, like apps, games, animations, and stuff like that. So ultimately I see this as something as being really big. Is that book for sale now, by the way, or not? not yet. We are finishing it up. Uh, so Anissa, she's calmed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're getting back to it, but okay. yeah, shortly. But we have incorporated that into um, curriculum and lesson plans and like you know, little short stories and activities for kids and stuff like that. Great. How do you plan on marketing the program to the parents or to the schools? Um, both. And so a, a big, uh, and so fortunately I have a great relationship with several schools throughout Northeast Ohio. And so when we have events and programs, they allow us to distribute our material there. Um, we do have a, a mailing list as well. Um, thanks. Um, and so, yeah, so to the schools and uh, directed to the parents as well. So I, I'm asking, I have a uh, question, two numbers. The, the first number I'm interested in is how many kids participated in any one of your programs in this last year? And the other number is, what was your budget for the last year? Um, so the number of kids that participated, and so with our one-day programs, we average around 50 to 60 kids. Uh, we just had one October 13th. We had 50, and we have one next Wednesday, and we're expecting around the same number. Um, and as far as our budget, a lot of our money, um, we, we have received uh, grant support, but a lot of it comes from fee-for-service or contract jobs where um, companies and organizations will hire our staff to, you know, do something. Um, and so this, just this year, um, all together, around forty-five, fifty thousand. So, with this being a nonprofit, it, it it sounds like it's not yet at that stage. But do you anticipate the the organization or business actually being self-supporting at any point, not requiring grant funding? Uh, yes, well, we do have our 501c3. We do have that. Um, and so ultimately, and in order to maintain that status, a certain amount of our money, I believe like a third, has to be uh, from grants. But what I'm looking at is more of the, the, the fee for service and as well as our um, selling products like our STEM boxes. And so that's something that we're currently working on right now. So it's like a subscription based STEM kits. And so from our programs, a lot of parents have been you know, inquiring about, you know, getting extra supplies to take home for other kids or, you know, to do stuff like that. And so we're working on, um, on that model. So a combination of fee-for-service and selling stuff. And that's time.
All right, so before I get started, I just want to ask everybody in the room, if you have a cell phone, if you could just raise your hand, if you own a cell phone, and if you have it on you, too. Awesome, so look around. Every single person has their hand up, so I just want to keep that in mind throughout the presentation. Uh, hello, my name is Ariella Yeager, and my company is Alula. Did you know that over 80% of women don't take their birth control on time because it wasn't on them at the time? Let me repeat that. 80% of women didn't take their birth control pill because it wasn't on them when they needed it. Now, currently birth control comes in that little pack on the left-hand corner. And there's a few things that can solve, you know, having it on you, which is like the easily carrying case, but it's kind of the same issue. And there's also alternatives. So you could get the patch, the ring, or the shot so that we don't have to remember all the time. But these are actually really expensive and they provide a lot of health risks to women. Now, you're probably wondering, why does a girl need to take her birth control, pill birth control pill on time? And guys, this will be a little, edu ed little educational for you, but when a woman doesn't take her birth control pill on time, it causes a lot of issues. There can be hormone imbalance, mood swings, there's a higher risk of pregnancy, and it also is an irregular cycle. Over 30% of women aren't even sexually active when they're taking the birth control pill. They need it for optimal health. So that's why we created Alula, the first phone case to hold, protect, and dispense women's birth control pills. I actually have a prototype I'll show you in a little bit, but pretty much you insert your own birth control, you spin the dial clockwise, it pops out, and you only need to refill it once a month, and your birth control is on you as much as everybody's phone, which was everyone in this room. We're also pairing this phone case with technology, which is an application that will remind you when to take your birth control pill, It'll also track your cycle, have a community-based platform for women to talk to each other, and also remind you when to refill your prescription so you never have to forget about it ever again. Now, when making this product, we wanted to make sure that we were adhering to the FDA. We know that our product does include medication, but we've been working with a regulatory consultant, and we are actually class one exempt, and we've been working through everything to make sure that we're good on the FDA front. Now, there's currently 18 million women who take birth control pills. And of those 18 million women, 4.7 million are in college. And we're actually targeting the college-age women that have iPhones. We actually did a study with our target market, and about 70% use the iPhone over the Android. So that's our target market initially starting. Now, we wanted to do some research. We had this idea. We wanted to make sure to validate it. So we did some research, and we surveyed over 170 girls on our own college campus, and we got pretty astounding results. Over 86% said that they would purchase our product right now at a higher price point than we even imagined. Now currently we do have a utility patent filed for this and we also do have a final working prototype. We have also just worked um, to find a local manufacturer in Aurora to do our first production, hopefully in January. And we already have an email list of over 500 early adopters of these girls that are ready to purchase our product as soon as we launch it because they want it so much. Now, our go-to-market strategy is going to be a little unique. We really wanted to look at how to target these women on college campuses. So first, we're going to have a campus ambassador program. We're starting here in Kent and then moving to college campuses all throughout the United States to make sure that influential women on every college campus can help push our product. We've also been doing heavy social media marketing because we know that that's where our target market is located. And on top of that, we've actually made contact with YouTube reviewers who want to review our product. Also, we've been working with an Indiegogo campaign that we're actually going to use as our launch platform because of how big of a reach it can give us and the momentum it can give as soon as we want to launch our product. We're also working with possible JV partners and also talking with other women organizations such as Planned Parenthood to see how we can tap into the network that they're already using with our target market. Now, as I mentioned, Indiegogo is going to be our main source of fundraising. In order for us to get this product off the ground, all we need is $30,000. And we actually already have 14,000 of that. So we're really only two months away from fully launching this product. And right now, we're fully ramping up and building our email list of women every day who are subscribing that want to purchase this product as soon as we go live. Now, we know that in the next few months, we will be launching our product. But we wanted to make sure that we're thinking of growth as well. So as I mentioned, in January, we hope to do our first run of production. And then in February, we hope to do a pre-launch via our Indiegogo campaign and get that final product. 
And then in May, we plan to launch our e-commerce business and get launched and listed on Amazon. And we already have been working with that. Um, and we have the e-commerce set up. And we also know how to get listed on Amazon. But we really plan to fulfill that in May. And then more towards the end of the year, we plan to release an Android case and then also expand into more female product lines and do a little bit of pri private labeling with local owned companies. Now, looking at our sales funnel, we kind of broke down what each of our marketing tactics and how many that's going to bring us. So we kind of broke it down between our campus ambassadors, our social media, the YouTube reviewers that we've been working with, and also our email list to get us down to the number of sales we believe that we can obtain. And looking at our three-year financials, um, when we looked at producing our product, our product is actually going to cost about $3.25. And then when you put in packaging, shipping, and all of that, we did aim high, but we're planning around $9. And we'll be selling the product for around $35 to $40 as well. Now, our team has been really great throughout this process because we've been surrounded by our target market on a college campus for the past four years. And something that's really great is I am our target market. I've been taking birth control since I was 16. So internally, the entire time we're really planning this and building this amazing product, we really understood what the customer's needs were and what problem we're solving for these women. And we've also been working with a lot of advisors. We're really active with the um, Jumpstart mentoring program through Burton D. Morgan through Jumpstart. And we're also a portfolio company of the Youngstown Business Incubator. And we've really surrounded ourselves with a group of advisors that have really helped us get to the point we're ready to actually start manufacturing next month. So I want to invite you to the future of women's health. Our company is so close to launching, and all we need is another $13,000 in order to get this product into the hands of women that want it right now. Thank you. All right, I will start. By the way, your business reminds me of, I have a friend that has a company called Ant Flow, and um, it's a subscription tampon business. There, yeah. But she's in Columbus, Claire oh, cool. Coder. Oh, yeah, no, she, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah she'd be a good person to connect with. Yeah, that'd be sure. great. Um, the one question I had was on the FDA approval side. Mm -hmm. So do you have to have FDA approval? Is your, your product, it's, it's essentially a case yeah. with the with a accompanying app. But is it because right. it's designed to hold medicine that you have yeah, to Yeah, so it does hold medicine. Um, but as long as we use FDA-approved materials, then we're, then we're good to go. And we already know what those are, and we've worked through the process. So, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. okay. How does the heat from the phone affect the Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so yeah, that's actually our main question that we get all the time. But we've actually been working with some really great product engineers in our manufacturer. And we've actually found a material that won't, the heat won't affect the pills at all. And we also made sure to look into birth control. We've actually talked to a few pharmacists on what will heat do to the medication. Will it degrade it? And actually, it would take such a significant amount. And with the materials we are using, we're really confident that that's not going to be an issue. Uh, you identified your, your initial need is $30,000. Mm -hmm. So where exactly does $30,000 get you? What's the end point? With yeah, so $30,000 actually gets us our first batch of product. Um, so from there, um, obviously, we're going to need a little bit. Um, the app is actually only going to be about $5,000 to build, and we're actually already in that process. But um, in order for us to launch the Indiegogo campaign, um, we would need that $30,000. So our kind of plan of action with that is we're actually launching the Indiegogo campaign and getting all those pre-sales in and then doing our first run of inventory to make sure that we have the orders in before we kind of get this bulk inventory or just sitting with it. Um, but that 30000 will get us to the point where we can accept those pre-sales and be 100% sure that we will be able to fulfill those orders. Okay. I have another one. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit more about the, the app and the, like the community yeah. concept that you're building. It seems like this is a business where... Like, that could become your single biggest marketing channel. Yeah, so um, obviously the main point of the app is so girls can understand where they're at with how many pills are in the case and things like that. Um, but we definitely want to have a community aspect. Um, we've looked at a few other apps, and there's, there are a few apps with communities, but they're not, you know, what we're actually going for. So we really want to make it so it's very college women oriented, which is our target market. So, you know, they can, if there's other women organizations on that campus that they want to talk to, or if they want to ask questions about maybe their cycle or just women things or, you know, help each other and push each other, we're really going to be building this community so girls, no matter where they're at, can actually communicate and have a really good forum to voice their opinion. Do you ever, do you see any sort of, 
do you see a revenue model beyond just a sale of a case? Like, is there any sort of recurring revenue model to it? Sure, yeah. So um, I, for the case, there isn't a recurring revenue model there. For the app, I can definitely see us, you know, pushing forward and creating a revenue model off the app as well. Um, but then when we were kind of looking at reoccurring revenue, you know, when we've been pitching this idea and we've been talking to people, there's a lot of people that have actually been asking, you know, I they might be older and they take heart medication or they take certain meds and they forget them every morning because they're so busy. And so our next kind of, you know, strategy after the birth control, we kind of did this because we knew our target market, we were surrounded by it, we were really confident in that. But I think moving forward, we're definitely going to be looking into daily medication and how can we brand this as a non-female product but an everyday product that people can use where it doesn't have to have the entire month's birth control but everyday medication as well for people that want it. Not being a person that takes birth control pills anyway, um, it, what What's the closest competitor to this, if anything? So yeah, far? so um, I think the closest competitor is just um, alternative One birth minute. control. So, you know, girls get um, the ring or the patch because they forget it all the time. A lot of my friends, they forget it constantly, and so they just end up getting an IUD or a ring or a patch. But like I said, they're extremely expensive. Um, like the normal birth control on the screen is normally zero with your insurance, $10 without insurance. Um, and they have really high side effects. There's actually a lot of causes of death um, with the ring and the patch, so. Sales projections for year four. For year four, um, that's a great question. I think we'd be around 1.5 million actually, um, because at that point we're really gonna be, you know, like he said, digging into the application and seeing what revenue stream is there. And I definitely believe by year three we're gonna be looking into starting the line of the daily medication and not just women's birth control. 10 seconds. Good. All right. We're going to go ahead. Ready to start? Hello, everyone. My name is David Yu, founder and CEO of UPatch LLC. So uh, it's getting pretty cold outside. And, and we all know what that means, right? Potholes, especially the ones that are big enough to break your car. Potholes that we call thumpers, a problem that we all love to hate. In fact, it's the number one complaint that we have as citizens. And municipalities around the country know this. Large cities like Cleveland and New York are spending millions of dollars a year on temporary pothole repair alone. Even smaller cities like Mansfield, Ohio, spent $200,000 last year uh, just on temporary pothole repair. And throughout the 19,000 municipalities in the United States, because the there are potholes everywhere, believe it or not, even in Hawaii, I was just there, uh, it's a multi-billion dollar problem. So the number one temporary solution is with cold pads. This is where you see two to four uh, municipal trained employees. They go up to a pothole, shovel in the material, stamp it down, make sure it adheres to the roadway. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to patch each pothole. And it's not exactly effective in inclement weather. So if it's wet or it's cold outside, that pothole patch is going to be at a high risk of failure, which is similar to all other temporary solutions. <coughs> If it's wet outside, if there's moisture on the ground, it's freezing temperatures, that patch is at a high risk of just popping out, which is a huge uh, waste of resources, which is a problem because we already have a lack of resources. Think of how many potholes can pop up overnight, especially during pothole season, during the colder months. The municipalities don't have the workforce to send enough people out there to hit all these piles in a timely fashion. And on top of that, you know they don't have uh, the money to, uh, to pay for, you know, the hundreds, thousands of crew members that are probably needed to hit all these potholes. So that's why what we have is, is the thump pad. The only temporary Band-Aid fix available. Huh? All right. Sorry about that. So with this, so this is the only temporary stopgap available. So with this, a single untrained employee like myself would use two hands, but they would go up to a thumper. One of the potholes that are going to break your car, what we call thumpers. Walk up to that thumper and simply place it in. Usually use two hands. And simply, and that, and 
an, almost immediately, you effectively quell the dangers that thumper presents by significantly reducing the shock of driving over that pothole or even bicyclists. And um, no adhesive is necessary. And even if that pothole, uh, that thumper is a mini pool or it's free sub-zero temperatures, the thumb pad's still going to work. And once the municipalities have the time or weather conditions are favorable, they can go back to that thumper, pick up the thumb pad, and put it back in their truck to reuse for up to six months. Now, there's no one size fits all with these thumpers because all potholes are different sizes. But we have two sizes fit most, and that's based on some research we did last year. And we have one patent uh, pending and two provisional patents to protect our IP. So as I said, the, the thumb pad is the only temporary Band-Aid fix available. We're not trying to replace cold patch or any of the other solutions available. We're just giving the municipalities the ability to, to buy some more time to do the job right. And we're also going to save them some money. First, we're going to decrease the cost of claims. So let's say cities are liable for car damage caused by your potholes. They have to reimburse you for that car damage. Problem is, a lot of these municipalities are pretty good at rejecting your claims. City like a city of Columbus has over a 97% rejection rate. Thing is, with rejecting those claims, there has uh, invest there, you have to do investigation, administrative costs, and then uh, if you if there's an appeal on that rejection, they have to bring the director of public works in for over half a day, in court. So instead, because I can patch a pothole, a thumper, just as fast as you saw, instead of and just as with a single employee rather than two to four employees. Uh, taking 10 to 15 minutes to patch each pothole, I can patch it up 20 times faster, which is going to really drop the number of claims and the number of complaints overall. With emergency repairs, let's say there's a bad storm, really bad thumper pops up, the supreme thumper, it's eating tires left and right. They got to call two guys in the middle of the night, and uh, because those guys are in the union, they're required to be paid at least three to four hours of labor. With equipment costs, you're looking at about four to $500 per repair. But in, and, and usually these repairs are done in inclement, when inclement weather conditions are present, meaning that could be four to $500 wasted. So instead, another municipal employee, like a police officer, fireman, somebody already on the road can just put the thump pad in that thumper, put, put in a work order, and the street crews will go and repair that, uh, that thumper when, during normal, normal operating hours or when conditions are favorable. And with the thumb pad, again, this is just a temporary Band-Aid fix to do the job right. And we're going to get to those thumpers at up to 20 times faster than the quickest method available, cold patch. And therefore, we're going to have safer roads, which is the most important goal overall. And the municipalities agree with the value that the thumb pad brings. And one of the reasons why is because I want to show you, uh, because of our product dem demonstrations. And here's raw footage for one with the city of Toledo. So we go up to a random thumper. That's a thumper. And then we, uh, you know, we ask one of the employees to say, hey, place this in there, see what happens. And that's what it is. And you can see the difference that the thumb pad makes. And this is, keep in mind, this is uh, raw footage. This is not our promo video, otherwise it'll look a little bit smoother. But you can see, this into any random thumper, you can see the significant difference that there is. And we've conducted 14 of these product demos since the end of August. We've converted 11 of those product demos uh, to beta sales, where these municipalities are buying 2 to 10 units to try them out and come back and reorder during pothole season later this year and early next year. We've done that with some of the largest cities and counties in Ohio. Uh, today we actually just uh, locked down Barberton, uh, right, our neighbor, neighbors next door. And also December 15th will be coming to Hudson, so you'll see us soon. And to help us meet demand, we've been working with Siemen Corporation for the last year. They've been, uh, they're a global industrial fabrics manufacturer based in Worcester, Ohio. My partner and I, we went uh, and met with the CEO and the VP of Innovation just last week. And, uh, he told, and they told us that Siemens Corp as a whole, they've been pushed by the board to take an initiative towards entrepreneurship. One of the biggest drivers behind that initiative is Mr. Richard Seaman, the owner. I see we were talking about a little bit. He's actually, he was not only the Ernst Young Entrepreneur of the Year, but he also serves on the Board of Trustees for the Burton D. Morgan Foundation. And he's really big on entrepreneurship, and he's the main driver behind this. So what that means is that Seaman Corp is going to take the thumb pad and release it as if it's a product, a product of their own. They're going to help us maximize sales. They've already hired workers, uh, employees, to, to, uh, to work specifically on fabricating the thumb pads. Top that, they're investing in heavy machinery so we can get to mass production. And based on the positive reaction that we've had so far for our municipalities, we've converted 11 out of 14 product demos into sales already. 
These are our forecasted financials. Now, I know these numbers look optimistic. I know they look pretty lofty, but let me break them down. 2018, we penetrate 50 municipalities selling 30 units each. 2019, 700 municipalities buying 30 units each. 2020, 3,000 municipalities buying 30 units each. To put that in perspective, there are over 900 municipalities in, in uh, the state of Ohio, over 19,000 municipalities in the United States, and don't forget about our neighbors up, uh, uh, up north that get a little bit more snow than us. And as we get more efficient with manufacturing processes, we'll be more and more profitable. So my background. Uh, I first started this idea when I was in Case Western Reserve University. A group of Case Western students actually uh, uh, conceptualized the idea, and they uh, saw some success from 2012 to 2013. Fast forward. Two minutes. Yeah, fa fast forward. Uh, 2015, uh, I'm a CPA with Ernst & Young. I wanted to do something else. I called my best friend college, Shimadiko Okoye, and I said, hey, what do you, you know, you were the co-founder of that pothole idea. What did you guys ever do with that? I said, well, you know, you've had a lot of internal conflict, can't work anything out, haven't done anything since 2013. I said, well, you know what? My background in accounting, your background in sales, and also your experience with the technology, we got what it takes to take this on. That's exactly what we did. And since we're new entrepreneurs, we've at, we're actually uh, in the Burton D. Morgan mentoring program run through Jumpstart as well to help us guide us through the way. We've also seen some success over the year. We've been... Uh, Featuring Cranes, The Plain Dealer, Channel 5, ABC News. We won the Mspire uh, grant through Magnet. We took second place in the Pitch View competition. And we are also in the due diligence stage of the Northeast Ohio Student Venture Fund. So we're getting things really moving. So why do, how are the funds going to help us? Winter is coming and so, are the, and, so are the, and so are the potholes. We need the money to purchase, to purchase inventory right now. Because right now, we cannot be a reactive company. We've done, the product we've done the market research, we've finished product development, and we know that our target market, the municipalities, have a true need for our product. We, we can't be reactive. We can't, you know, when they put in an order, we can't say, all right, we'll get it to you in a month. When they put in these orders, we need to be ready to deliver it by tomorrow. And the sooner that we get these thumb pads out, the more data that we're going to get from these municipalities so we can further improve our, bag continu our, thumb our product continually as the season goes on. So thank you. I'm also going to bring up my partner, Chimidiko Koye, to answer questions as well. So, get a little backup there. This one's been on the road, actually. Don't put it on the chair. So, what do you project the seasonal loss rate will be as a percentage? Of thumb pads lost, like stolen? Stolen, destroyed by plows, so sucked for... into the earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so for... It's... You know, we haven't put a specific uh, projection on that, but, you know, for, in terms of stealing, so you guys kind of felt that, right, that we walked from flash, uh, from flash starts uh, back to our apartment on West 9th. That was not fun. There, <laughs> and there is no, so that's only a block you away. You couldn't find a pothole to dump it in on the way? Come we on. did, we did. I've that was our here. only prototype. We had a demo the next day. We had a demo the next day. And you could feel that, that you know, we walked around a block with that thing. I'm already sweating. I'm, I'm already moving. There's no resale value. There's no scrap metal on that thing. Plus, once you actually see in the road, this is after I washed it. It's really gross. It actually turns gray usually after it's on the road for a little bit. And then in terms of snow plows, what it's designed to be, it's supposed to be put uh, below the grade of the road. But we've talked with our, tar yeah, I know. We've, we've, talked with our, we've talked with our municipalities. And they say, you know, right now, everybody that's using it right now, we're not using this over a week or two weeks. And especially when they know snow plows are going out, they're not gonna be putting it out there. They know what this is. They know that this is a quick Band-Aid fix. They know there's gonna be li some limitations around it. So they're gonna try and minimize you know, the snow plows on there because you know, it's gotta be so, safe. So not to belabor this, but when will you actually have metrics on that number? By the end of this pothole season. So this is gonna be, a, a pothole season ends about May. And how are you going to collect those numbers? So with the municipalities, especially the ones that participate in beta sales, they've agreed to, you know, give us feedback, give us, you know, all the surveys and all that. But, uh, but when we did do testing with Montgomery County last year, we put some down for multiple weeks in some areas that are actually undesirable, like lots of foot traffic, lots of crime nearby, and none of them came out missing. So. No, I, I don't actually don't think theft is going to be a big issue for, for, for lots of reasons. It's more environmental destruction. What, it, how defensible is this versus some other, you know, somebody sees the success you're having and they're like, we should create a pothole filler 
bag company, you know? Like, what's the, uh, how so do you the defend so, against So we've been working on this for the last two years, Jim and I. You know, we've hired some really good, uh, you know, we've contracted a accredited lab just to come with the fluid itself. Design, that's another thing. But with the fluid inside, so that's a shear, th not, uh, shear thickening non-Newtonian fluid. Mm -hmm. Oobleck, cornstarch water. Somebody played with that before? All right, well, it's weird stuff. <laughs> and it's actually, it's like cornstarch water, there's a lot of limitations on that. So with this one, there's going to be no problem with segmentation. There's, you know, the part, it's going to stay, all the particles are going to stay suspended in there as well. And then on top of that, we, have, we drop down the freezing point as well, and then we've also found out a way how we can mass produce this. So we're also going to be prepared for that. And then on top of that, with the... Uh, with, uh, Two minutes. Yeah. With our IP as well, we, they are all pending, but we've talked to a lot of law firms. And, they're, you know, all prior art, the only prior art there, there is, is there is a speed bump that's filled with this non-Newtonian fluid. Ours is a little bit different. So that's why we're going to be working on that, investing a lot of money on that <coughs> heavily as the year goes on. Is there another solution available aside from just filling the potholes? Are there any other... Uh, solutions out there. Putting a traffic cone inside and hoping everybody dodges it. I'm dead serious. Oh, yeah. Allentown, Pennsylvania, we'll quote them on that. They told us that that's what they would do. So we'll come back to them later. But anyways, they also repaving the roads is the only way to actually permanently fix these. Cold patch, still six to eight months. They know they're going to come back and redo it. Okay. And, and that cold patch, it's $500 cost, I think I remember. Just the emergency John, repairs. Right. It's cheap. You know, if they're doing it during the day, it is cheap, but it's just, right. it's just buying them time. You know, this okay. is, it's not trying to replace them. They are, it's cheap, you know, but sometimes in the inclement weather, high risk of failure, you know, just make sure they do the job right. Cause all what about One more minute. Like, what's the range that uh, a municipality might pay for? Uh, so right now, you know, we, at first, you know, we wanted to go by the value of the product. And we said for about $250 for each of these bags, They've all agreed with it. You know, we've definitely had some pushback from some in the county, especially the ones that we told 170 at first. You know, but 250, they've been receptive to it as well. So they understand okay. the product, they know what it is. Okay. So the I, we met before on the previous technology, if if you yeah. recall, that was different. Uh, well, actually, at the time, we were students. We won a lot of competitions. We won a lot of cash, but we actually hadn't really done any product development. But it wasn't a bag, though, if I remember correctly, oh, was it? It was, it was always <laughs> a bag, but at the time, it was actually, because uh, we conceptualized it first by putting a bunch of uh, silly money into my backpack. We drove on top of it. So then later, we were like, okay, how about we put it into, like, this uh, this sack that we sewed, but then you could kind of like, roll up. It was like an elephant. I'm going to say it even worse than that because it was, uh, <laughs> it was, a, it was a vinyl tarp bag that was, like, stitched together That's on time. the sides. Okay. <laughs> it was terrible. And it was filled with cornstarch and water. <laughs> Thank you. Got the winners. Before we do that, I would just like to give, let's give one more round of applause for all of the finalists. Um, I also want to thank the Bernie Morgan Foundation once again for sponsoring the event. Thank you. And, um, of course, our judges who had the hardest job tonight. Thank you for coming out and taking the time to be here. Um, if you are a winner, um, please don't just go. Um, we'll have some paperwork that we need you to fill out. We also want to do a couple photographs as well. Um, okay. So... In third place, Onco Solutions. In second place, the U Patch. <laughs> and first place, Alula. <laughs> Congratulations, winners. And congratulations to everybody that participated.